Hello and welcome to another episode of Ultra Running Underdogs and I am Joel Walters and this is our co-host Mike King. Why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest for tonight? Yeah, um, so we have a special guest again. Uh, we're continuing the series of interviews with Coach Matt Sheeks. Uh, welcome, Matt. Uh, what are we going to be exploring tonight? Hey, good to be here again, Mike. Um, I just want to put in a quick preface that the last time I was on this show, I called you guys the undertrained underdogs. Um, <laughs> Mike quickly rectified that, and so he is back to full altar running underdog status. Um, you know, I couldn't rightly call him under trained when his long run is longer in duration than mine. So, um, I think he nipped that one in the bud. So nice work, Mike. Training's been going great. Um, yeah, we're going to be challenging beliefs surrounding periodization. And so periodization is a big topic, um, in endurance sports and running, ultra running, triathlon, um, really any endurance sport. And it's something that almost all of us do. And we're just going to challenge some of the beliefs that are behind uh, periodization um, and examine if it's something that we even really need to be doing. And the, the main way that we're going to do that is we're going to look at the training of Robert DeCastola. I'm probably butchering his name, but he was the world record holder in the marathon uh, back in the 1980s. And he arguably had the perfect marathon um, career in terms of he performed very well in marathon for a, an extremely long period of time, which almost no other marathoner has been able to match. So that's what we're doing today. Oh, excellent. So Matt, let me ask a question. So, so periodization, I've heard about it. What has been your experience with uh, periodization? Well, it's been, it's been a good experience. Most of my coaches have done some sort of periodization strategy. And so I've kind of lived and breathed it. And so what typically is happening is you're, um, you're doing base training. So let's say you're going to run cross country in the fall and you're a high school or college runner. So you would do basically just distance running for a period of two to three months. Uh, with no interval training, no VO2 max training, um, not even really much for fartlicks or tempo runs to speak. And then you would start doing your speed training when you're getting closer to your actual race season, um, maybe eight to 10 weeks out from, from your big races. So that's a very brief overview. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think I've experienced some form of that. Uh, I may not have realized it was periodization, but definitely um, some form. Yeah, most running coaches are going to have their athletes do some sort of, you know, summer training plan where, uh, like I say, there's no speed training and it's viewed as a good thing that we don't do speed training because we're trying to build our aerobic fitness, right, and our aerobic base so that we can handle the speed training um, once we get to that training phase. And so I've always seen it as, you know, it's like a, it's a, it's canon, you know, it's like, um, an unchanging truth for endurance athletes that we must build our base and do absolutely no intervals, you know, no speed work. Um, you can do strength training and you can do sprints and fast strides, but nothing that would, you know, kind of get your heart rate above threshold for almost the entire base training period. Uh, and that's the way that I've uh, like always approached it. And that's the way that I've like always thought about it. But then occasionally someone will come along and completely destroy all of uh, my beliefs and assumptions about it. And Robert DeCastle is one of those people. Cool. So what are some well-known athletes who use periodization effectively? Yeah, so Arthur Lydiard kind of um, pioneered the strategy along with the Eastern Germans. Uh, that's my understanding of it anyway. And so he's he was the coach of Peter Snell. Uh, Peter Snell ran a 143, 800 meters on a grass track in New Zealand. He also ran a 354 mile in the 1960s on a grass track in New Zealand. Uh, and then Murray Hallberg was the Olympic gold medalist. Um that also ran under Lydiard. So those guys would be kind of considered the pioneers of periodization. And then um, 
uh, carrying forward from there, Lasse Viren um, was uh, kind of under the same uh, thinking. He had a different coach, but he was definitely under the same thinking as Lydiard. Um, and so those would be some three very prominent runners. Then you kind of fast forward to triathlon and how triathletes picked it up. And the names that come up most frequently for that would be Philip Maffetone and Mark Allen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Philip Maffetone was an exercise physiologist and he worked with Mark Allen and Mark Allen had really inconsistent, uh, racing results until he encountered Phil Maffetone. Phil Maffetone slapped a Hari monitor onto Mark Allen and said, Hey, you must not exceed 150 beats per minute for the first two and a half months of your training. Uh, if your heart rate is going to go over 150 and you're out on a run, uh, you need to start walking to keep it under 150. <laughs> and Mark, Mark Allen was religious about uh, approaching his base training that way, where he would he would not do an interval like we're saying. He would not do speed work. He would not do intervals. And that led him to um, winning the Ironman six times. I don't think they was six times in a row. Oh, but it was very close. I think there was maybe one year in there where he, he did not win. Um, but it worked very well for him. He was very inconsistent prior to picking up the, the training program with Phil Maffetone. Uh, and then he had just awesome results year after year after year um, with a kind of a periodized strategy. So a lot of people looked at him and what he did um, in, in triathlon training. Cool. So it sounds like there are some pretty well-known athletes that use it effectively. How about on the flip side, what are some athletes that are non-periodizers? That's a, that's a hard one to say. <laughs> well, so this came as a shock to me. Um, I had a, a friend who ran for University of Oregon, and uh, we would always run together like during the summer, during the off-season, perhaps during you know winter break and things like that. And he told me about the training and um, he was there when the, the coach, um, the head coach transitioned from, I forget the previous coach's name, but it, it switched to Vin LaNana and Vin LaNana was the head coach of, of, at Stanford prior to moving to U of O. And he carried great successes with him wherever he went. Um, so there are a slew of good guys that ran under Vin. Uh, both at Stanford and at U of O. And so my friend who was from Woodville as well, he told me about their, their training and he was in like week two or week three of training. And I was uh, shocked and horrified that they were, he was going to get on the track and do five by a thousand or six by 800 or something like that, just out of the blue, having no base training under him at all. And having just finished his two weeks off, it seemed like that was uh, anathema to me. And I, I was surprised that, Vin Lanano is coaching people like that. I didn't know that that was a possibility. I thought that was, you know, would definitely lead to um, the negative results. So, so Vin Lanano, so anybody that ran under him, I assume had some sort of non-periodization strategy. Um, oh man, who are some of those guys? Uh, Louis Lucini, Grant Robeson, um, the guy that ran the 204 in the marathon. He didn't do that under Vin, mm. but um uh, what is his name? Ryan Hall. <laughs> oh, know right. Ryan Hall. Heard of yeah, him. <laughs> uh, he, he ran under Vin, I believe. Um, there were just a ton of just, just absolute studs that ran under Vin. So, uh, and then Robert, Robert DeCastella and someone will have to, you know, correct me on my, um, pronunciation of his name, but, uh, Australian marathoner, uh, and his nickname is Deeks. I guess he went by Deeks. So maybe mm. it's, Maybe I'm close because I got the D part right. Um, so those would be two examples of non-periodizers that were very successful, you know. And and I'm I'm shocked because it it seems to me that my experience has been that the periodization strategy works quite well, and it's kind of a hallmark to the way that I coach people. So would you say that uh, periodization is pretty much mainstream these days and that most plans have some sort of a periodization format to them? Or is it still, you know, controversial in some circles? And I'd say that it's, it is mainstream. It is traditional. But I don't know if there's a lot of scientific support to mm. say that it, it's the preferred strategy. Um in fact, whenever you take a group of people and you have them do really hard interval training with 
and they haven't been doing it, you know, you have them do maximal um, intervals at VO2 max, things like that. Uh, it'll show an improvement, but the duration of these studies, you know, you have someone do um, uh, eight by three minutes at VO2 max, you know, twice a week for five weeks on uh, an exercise bike, and then you go test their their 40K time trial performance before and after, they, they will inevitably uh, improve once they're tested again, right? Mm. And this is, these are well-trained athletes, right? Um, and so then the question is, well, it was, this was only a, a snapshot in time. Would the improvements endure past the 68 week time period or would there, would there be a, a, a period of time where the, the athletes performances drop off? Right. So there, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I wanted to jump into a couple of beliefs that seem to mark the periodizers. Um, and, uh, and, and this will kind of shed some light on, on what I'm talking about here with, um, uh, these studies, the, the length of, um, uh, time one can do interval training and it, and it still, um, produces a good result. So, um, so a couple of the beliefs and they seem to stem from Arthur Lydiard, you know, these would be things that I would have believed and, uh, would have led to my shock and horror when I heard about what, how Vin was training people and, um, being very successful with it. So the, the first one is that the improvements you gain season after season, year after year due to aerobic improvements, not due to anaerobic improvements. Uh, and I think now it's arguable that even when you're doing um, lactate threshold maximal workouts, like, are you really anaerobic? Um, there's, that's been called into question by Tim Noakes and, and other guys. Um, so, but a lot of people do have that experience where they have a, a, they have a season where they did not increase their volume at all. And therefore their, um, uh, their performances basically stagnate and then they bump up their volume the next season. Let's say they bump it up by a good 10 to 15%. Like I had a season where I was running uh, 85 to 90. I had done hundred to 105 in the past and I stagnated um, and 85 to 90 was all I could handle that one season. I, I knew that I wanted to be doing more, um, but that's all that my body could handle at the time due to um, having had several injuries um, so I stagnated, you know, I was, I was kind of just getting by once I was able to increase my mileage. So it went up from 85 to 90 back up to, uh, 115 to 125. Uh, my performances just shot through the roof. Right. Um, so that's one thing that people have, people have noticed is that, um, it seems like when, it seems like volume has to increase season after season if performances are going to improve, right? The second thing is that it seems like speed training just isn't effective when you're not in shape. Um, and it, it seems to make sense that, um, like I'll encounter a lot of athletes where their speed training pace is not a whole lot faster there than their endurance training pace. And so they can only do intervals on the track at nine minute mile pace, but they're, um, their base training pace is about nine thirties. It's like, well, what's the point in doing interval training? Like it, it seems like they're revved out in mm -hmm. nine minutes. Um, I would rather them just get in better aerobic shape so that the speed training is more effective. Right. And that's the way that I would have seen it. Um, so for myself, you know, I, I could, I could kind of, um, start doing, let's say I'm doing thousand meter repeats. Okay. This is the example that I got down. And when I'm out of shape, uh, if I started doing those, um, I would be doing them at like 305 um, per 1,000. You know, this is back in the college days. And then after a period of six to eight weeks of doing thousands, maybe I'd be down to 257, right? Um, but if I started doing the thousands when I was in, in shape after I had a good base phase, then maybe I would start at 256 and I'd peak out at running thousand meter intervals at 253 to 251. And, you know, these are virtually real numbers that like actually happened. Right. And so, um, so it, it seems like, um, once you start doing the interval training, um, your performance is basically going to be fixed or, or limited after that point. 
and you cannot make substantial aerobic improvements once you start doing the interval training. So that's another belief of periodizers is mm -hmm. basically like, Hey, once you start doing your intervals, like the clock is stopped as far as aerobic improvements that we can make. And we're going to, um, capitalize on that aerobic fitness, but no further aerobic gains are going to be possible where I can, you know, exponentially improve my, um, my fitness levels. Mm. And, uh, Matt, quick question. So then there. You're just um, kind of stuck with that performance level. Yeah. Is, is that because that uh, in order to do the intervals, you have to cut the volume, the aerobic volume. So, you know, your midweek runs and stuff are basically going to be, what, less at, or fewer just to make place for those intervals? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what mm -hmm. I noticed is that up, up at the higher mileages, if I was doing 105 to 110 per week, uh, during base training, and then I started doing interval training, I'd have to cut by at least 10% to mm -hmm. kind of just be able to absorb and accommodate, um, the hard interval training. And, um, part of that was, was, um, avoiding injury as well. Did I answer the question? You did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, so anyway, so one can see that there is practical support for these theories. Um, it is really hard uh, and difficult to add miles and intensity at the same time. So you kind of want to be adding one or the other at, at a time. Uh, and so that's, you know, perhaps one tally in, in favor of the periodizers. Uh, and then another thing is that improvements made season after season, they, they seem to come when the runner has engaged in big miles um during the off season or preseason if the, and if they're under uh sort of the numbers that they've done in the past they're probably going to underperform basically the entire season and there's no hope of uh of salvaging that season so people have experienced this the world over so it's no wonder that people kind of keep going back to the periodation strategy right yeah that seems to make sense yeah um, yeah. Along the along these lines, uh, Tim Noakes has uh, mentioned that there appears to be a short swing, what's called a short swing and a long swing athlete. So a short swing athlete responds to their interval training after a period of about four to six weeks. After that, they don't really have many more improvements after that. So there's not really a reason for a short swing athlete to um, to do intervals for much longer than that. And then there's a long swing athlete and they can go up to about 10 weeks. Uh, and uh, Tim Noakes claims that um, uh, that Ron Hill substantiated this claim. And Ron Hill is another really good marathoner, um, probably a predecessor to Robert DeCastola. Um, but he noticed that his, his performances would stagnate after about 10 weeks of hard interval training. After that, he would experience an inevitable decline in his performances. So that's why he would try to time his interval training um, to, to reap the rewards of it, like right at the right time during his race season. Um, so, uh, uh, on a personal note, I was, um, on a trip in Kenya, um, running with some, some Kenyan folk. And it was kind of like a, um, it was kind of a mission trip with athletes in action. Uh, but we were running with the junior national team. Uh, for Kenya, and we had along with us an exercise physiologist. His name was, was Chris. And uh, a lot of us in the group had had this experience where we had done a lot of intervals and we had kind of gone belly up right during the most important part of the, of, uh, the track or cross country season. And I was asking him why this was, if it had something to do with periodization or if it was another reason. And he seemed to think based off of his studies that you were basically just training too differently than the event that you were racing in. And so people will try to sharpen and peak, sharpen and peak, sharpen and peak for forever. And <clears throat> let's say you're a 5K runner or a 10K runner and you've been running 200s for four weeks or even 400s for four weeks. Well, you've been running faster mm -hmm. than race pace and um, arguably training different energy systems for a long time because you're, you're kind of seeing this peaking process is like we're, we're trying to come to some sort of crescendo and, um, and, and feel our best on race day, and that's going to produce the best benefit. But um, 
people will end up in the situation where they haven't experienced the type of pain that they're going to experience during a race and work the same sort of energy systems. Uh, and then they suffer from re really poor performances. So he seemed to think that, that it was just the, the type of workouts, right? They, they weren't working the right type of energy system for what they were going to experience in a race. Yeah, that seems to make, make sense. You know, that if you do too much of, um, you know, interval work, you know, when you're trying to run a marathon or something, you know, too much of what you think is a good thing may come back to bite you later, you know, when some of your other skills, you know, kind of roll off the back end. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could, you could ridiculize this argument and say, hey, if, if Mike King spends all the time in the gym and no time running, what's going to happen to his ultra performances? Well, we can all see how that's going to pan out, right? Um, so maybe that's the mistake. Uh, we were running with guys that were, you know, the Kenyans will train incredibly hard. They'll run three times per, per day. Right. And I was trying to ask um, uh, Chris, the exercise physiologist, well, why, why does this work then? Like, what's, what's the point? Like, what's the big idea that you've uncovered with all of your studies that you've done? And he seemed to think mitochondrial density was basically like one of the hugest factors for your, uh, your endurance performance. Uh, and the mitochondria, they're, they're kind of like the powerhouses of the cells. Um, you know, I'd probably have to brush up to give you a super scientific definition of what the mitochondria are actually doing. But I, I think they're, you know, moving along the substrates and stuff that you um, that you burn during exercise. Maybe maybe one of you guys can help me out with this. Um, but when you go out and train long, you know, you 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 can just build and build and build mitochondrial or mitochondria. Your mitochondrial density can go way, way up and you've just got like way more powerhouses in your cells compared to the next person that isn't putting in quite so much volume and that makes a huge difference i have heard yeah, that about mitochondria and i think maybe related to mathetone like the the idea that if you run in this lower heart rate zone that you kind of develop mitochondria efficiencies maybe better than like uh, some other person that's running maybe a faster heart rate that's possible. Sure. I mean, I think it's mainly more just that you can spend more time uh, training. And so that, that gives you more time to build yes. the mitochondria as opposed to the intensity being the right one. So um, it's all about volume then as far yeah. as mitochondria. Yeah, that seems start. to be what he was saying. Yeah, because I don't think the Kenyans were following a, stick, a strict periodization schedule either. Um, but they would be just training like madmen you know three like i say they're running at they're running at 6 a.m at 10 a.m and then again at 5 p.m and that's almost a daily schedule mm. well they run pretty fast <laughs> I have it, some works. Yes, it works <laughs> just copy the strategy yeah. and you guys will be good <laughs> that's right i um, have to eat their diets too <laughs> yeah another thing that is another tally uh for the periodizers that people have just, you know, by experience, they've noticed this is that there have been a lot of people that have switched to a more Lydiard-esque uh, sort of periodization strategy, and then they've all of a sudden had awesome results. So um, we mentioned Mark Allen already. So he, he kind of made the switch and um, he could run um, at his mathetone pace. He could run, a, he, he was going about 815 per mile, 830 per mile, somewhere in there. So at 150 beats per minute, that's that's how fast he was going. He was going 830s, right, for mm. six six miles or five miles, just the same test that we do with you, Mike. And by yeah. the end of his career, after he had followed Mathetone's advice for so long, he was able to run 530 pace at the wow. same heart rate at yeah. 150. No, no, <laughs> so I, he had I really made some big improvements. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, exactly. <laughs> After how many uh, miles would you say, like how many lifetime miles do you get from 830 to 530 at the same mafetone heart rate? Any idea? Uh, this must have been over the course of 10 or 12 years, I think. <laughs> okay, so thousands of miles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you could argue that uh, relatively like 150 um was a higher relative uh, exertion level for Mark by the end there. Cause I bet that his, like his threshold 
was lower by the time uh, you got to, towards the end of his career. You know, maybe his lactate threshold was 180 at the beginning, and then it's 170 by the time he's he's getting close to retirement. Mm. Um. Yeah. So 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 Mark Allen was one. Any, anyway, we can probably move on from that. Um, and, and then the last thing that's kind of another tally is that athletes seem to perform well in championship races, specifically with a periodization strategy. So it's kind of seemed to produce the most winners. And so that's another reason people are hesitant to move away from it because um, we all want to win. And ultimately it doesn't matter worth crap what some scientific mm. study is saying. We're going to copy the guy that's the fastest. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, yeah, that's no how doubt. this works in reality, right? <laughs> so, um yeah, so, so those are those are all the reasons that that seem to uh, indicate we should periodize. But there's not a lot in terms of um, actual like scientific evidence or studies that are showing that it does work. Um, Matt, can you outline what what is a periodization schedule look like? So I know we talked, you know, maybe in the beginning you would do a lot of slow volume work. And is it just a matter of adding intervals later or are there different steps where you add maybe hills? You know, you do, you know, different kinds of speed work. How, how, does, how does it look? You know, how do these programs look? If somebody like there, listened to this interview and wanted to put there something are, together. There are different steps and that's really important. And there's different, um, there's different coaches that have had their, their ways of doing things. Um, what I would consider to be like the bread and butter um, Arthur Lydiard strategy is you, you do have your base building period where um, your intensity in your runs is almost the same on every single run, whether that's a 10 miler, whether that's your long run, you know, it's all done about probably about at that maffetone heart rate or a little bit lower. And so it's done at kind of your easy, moderate to moderate sort of exertion level. So you can kind of come back. You can, you know, if you do 12 miles um, one day, you can kind of come back and do something similar the next day and the next day and the next day. You don't really need much of a recovery day from that because you're um, just the exertion level is so similar, right? So that's your base period where you're just doing like your training is basically like all the same. Um, then what's missed in a lot of modern schedules is that Arthur Lydiard would have people do a, a hill um, a cycle for about a month. And his hills were not even traditional hill intervals where they were like running the hill as hard as they could at, at VO2 max effort level. They were actually bounding the hills. So they would get on a really, really steep incline and they would do some sort of like bounding or springing sort of step mm. up a fairly long hill. And if you actually do this workout, your heart rate is absolutely jacked. It's through the roof, you know, because you're recruiting this huge muscle mass. And so it's really, really difficult. You know, it's not easy, even though you're not even um, doing a traditional run. <laughs> I mean, you are running, but it's like you're you're bounding and springing up the hill as opposed to, to doing kind of the fastest, most efficient run. Um, so he would have his athletes do that for four weeks. Uh, they would bound their crazy hill, you know, four times per session. That hill interval workout uh, in itself was a 12 mile run um, and includes some shorter, faster striding during the workout and, you know, warm up and cool down and, and all that jazz. Uh, then they would move into their traditional interval training. So kind of your 20 by 400, your, uh, your eight by 800 um sort of workouts and they would do that for four weeks and then they would have a, a four to five week sharpening phase and i'm assuming they're kind of racing during their sharpening phase and then you know hopefully the sharpening phase is ending with their biggest races uh and then they would bring down the the difficulty of the intervals but they would be these guys would race a lot so the need to be mm -hmm. going out and hammering out intervals was not as high um, and they would also do time trials. So if Mike King is a 5K runner, uh, you know, if Arthur Lydiard was coaching him, Mike would be doing a 3,000 meter time trial like in the middle of the week um, and seeing how he's running in those and then um, kind of altering his training based on how the time, for the time trial went. So, so those were his phases. So you basically had the base phase, 
the hill phase, um, the, the kind of the traditional interval phase, and then the sharpening phase. So I would consider that to be pretty normal. Uh, one other thing that I've noticed, and um, this would go back to Daniels, who's an, an American distance running coach. I think he's American anyway. Uh, so not the alcohol, Joel. This is different Jack Daniels we're talking about here. Um, <laughs> I, I know Jack. I got it. I've heard of him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you guys have all met Jack because um, you were altitude training, right? And he's he's like a pioneer on altitude training. So I mean, you mix some altitude training with some some actual Jack, and well, some weird stuff could happen. <laughs> um, oh, I imagine. Anyway, so Jack Daniels, his strategy is to do your VO two max workouts first. So let's say you did your base training. Let's say you did three months of base training. He throw you right into hard VO two max work. Yeah, either in hill repeats or intervals on the track. Then he'd move you into lactate threshold and tempo workouts next in his next phase. So this seems to defy common sense because he's going from kind of like slow to very fast to kind of medium fast. And then into racing. And he found that that did better. And one of my coaches uh, employed that strategy. And I think that that worked pretty well. Uh, but that's kind of the Jack Daniels strategy. And I, I still do that to some degree. Uh, that seems to work well for triathletes because um, they're more likely, their race intensity is more likely to be that tempo or lactate threshold effort level. So it makes sense to have that be closer to their actual races and the VO2 max to be. Um, prior to that so that when you're getting to the races your workouts are actually like at race pace or a little bit faster yeah and i've heard a lot about uh training specificity closer to your actual race event date so that makes sense to me um, right no, that would seem to track with that exactly yeah so we kind of covered beliefs about periodization I don't know, Mike, did you have any other questions? Uh, um, no, not really. I, I think that, you know, the periodization programs probably have a lot of different names, um, you know, systems that people use. I know I've been doing the 80-20 system, you know, where it's like 80% of it is super easy running, which sounds like Maffetone type stuff. 20% is hard, you know, so you only, you know, do you know, maybe two, two days a week of some sort of intervals and stuff. But, you know, even, even with those programs, they have some form of periodization and, um, you know, so yeah. Well, before, sure. I, yeah, before coming into this interview, I thought periodization was like ramping up and then on the third or the fourth week you ramp down. I thought that's what periodization meant, but like during this interview, it sounds like it's more about interval training specifically and how you employ that in a coaching plan yeah you're describing a meso cycle um so that's part of the periodization strategy is to have those those three weeks up and the one week down and you typically do that in each phase whether it's an intensity phase or whether it's a base building phase so yeah you're you're right and that that is usually part of the strategy um so we want to talk about about Deeks, right? And and look at his training really briefly. So I was going to share my screen uh, if you guys don't mind, so we can um, take a look at what he did, and maybe that'll give us some perspective, uh, both on just how much you you have to train to be successful in marathon, and also uh, and also a little bit about this this periodization debate. Um, but you can see his, his training schedule here. And so one thing that he did that kind of defies kind of your typical Lydiard uh, periodization strategy is that he would do the, the same training every single week. Um, and he did not periodize at all. And he had this coach, um, Pat Clohesse, that um, just did not believe in periodization for whatever reason. Um, so I think there probably was some uh, some sort of buildup. Like I'm guessing he didn't take three weeks off and then go straight into 120 mile week. Um, but he would basically do the same training every single week. So it's very easy to look at him as a case study because just everything is the same week to week. So Monday is six miles easy uh, and, uh, in the morning, six miles easy in the morning, uh, 10 miles easy in the evening, uh, Tuesday, six miles easy. Um, 
in the afternoon it's hill repetitions totaling 11 miles including warm up and warm down and i'm guessing that this is probably i don't know you know six to eight by two minutes six to eight by three minutes somewhere in there um, it doesn't really say so he's got one hard workout on tuesday um, then he's got a medium long run on wednesday of 18 miles run at 615 pace um, and oh and by the way he's still doing his morning run that day <laughs> so he's getting 24 for the day uh and then curiously on thursday he's coming back and he's doing six miles easy and then his track workout is eight by 400 now i find this interesting because no modern day marathon runner would train like this right he's basically doing two really short track uh track or vo2 max workouts per week and other than that he's not doing any tempo workouts um, or lactate threshold workouts to speak of. He's just basically doing like VO2 max or faster. So he's doing eight by 462 to 64 seconds with the 200 meter jog. Um, this would be considered, you know, respectable, but it's not anything outstanding. Like these times are not anything that, that I haven't done in um, a short 400 workout like this. So he's getting nine miles total there. Then Friday, 6 and 10, so he's getting his, his easy day is 16, as you can see. Um, Saturday, he gets his 10 miles hilly in the morning so that he can recover by doing 6 miles easy in the afternoon and then be in uh, really good form for his 22-miler um, on Sunday. So his long run is uh, a hilly 22 miles at 6.15 pace. And then for whatever reason, doubles um, on his long day and gets a total of 28. For the week so he claims that um he basically just trained the same but he was getting in um he says his normal training load is 135 miles per week and um and he says i've averaged 110 miles per week for the last four years uh and he basically is his claim is that he did not ever really get injured and so he's able to just kind of run a consistent mileage um for years and years straight so um you know one could argue there's a lot of aerobic running in this program but it's not the typical periodization um that that we're accustomed to seeing in you know in the running world or in the in the triathlon world so i i thought this was really interesting and um you know i kind of want to like basically copy a strategy and, and and see how it works and um kind of test myself so, so that's what I had to share today. And, you know, like I say, his, um, his performances were, were, were awesome. If you look at um, this article from runnerstribe.com, it's, it's got his uh, results. And you can see from 1983 all the way up to 1992, um, he's performing well like that entire 10-year uh, period you know, running between, it looks like it's, a, he's starting out at about, um, 214 in the marathon. Um, and, and he's kind of getting down at his prime to, to 207 at, at Boston. Um, but he's running 208s, 208, 208, 209, 207, um, one hour, two minute, um, half marathon, 208 and 209. Um, so he's just ultra consistent off of this training plan, which makes it worthy to look at, in my opinion. Yeah, and he was, yeah, you're right. He was pretty big. I, I saw he was like five foot 11. That is, seems to be pretty big for a runner with that kind of uh, speed, you know, for marathon. Yeah, it's not that big. I mean, he, he's got big legs. It sounds like he weighed about 143. So he's got, yeah. yeah he's, he, but he's, he's built in the legs, which he claimed had some impact in him not getting injured. I wish I was running 110 miles per week for four years without injury. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those are similar numbers to what I was able to put up in college. You know, I probably ran for only a year or a year and a half um, between 115 and 140. And, you know, I was getting better and better. Uh, I actually ran one year post-college before becoming a triathlete. And I was able to kind of maintain 135 to 140, you know, week after week after week. Um, but I wasn't as diligent with my speed training and I kind of, mm. uh, and I did kind of, um, 
uh, I did kind of stagnate after that. And I, I wonder if it was, you know, not being in the, the team atmosphere, doing those hard workouts um, that led to the stagnation. Well, I certainly know stagnation. That's why I hired you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, what are your guys' reactions from seeing DeCastellis training? Uh, I, I thought it was interesting. It seems very different from what a lot of people are doing. Um, you know, the, just the fact that he repeats the same program just over and over and over, and he got great results. I mean, a two-hour, seven-minute marathon, you know, that's nothing to, to joke about. That's, that's pretty good. Um, well, so, personally, I haven't done more than like 70 miles in a week. So first of all, it's a lot of mileage. And uh, mm. I guess the two a days and 28 miles in a day, that sounds like a lot to me. But I guess if you're doing 110 miles a week, you got to fit in the mileage somehow. <laughs> so that's right. I think the two a day makes a yeah. lot of sense because you get that rest in the middle of the day. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, you basically have to once you're once you're getting over about like ninety or so, like it really starts to make sense to start doing the double runs. Mm. Uh, my bread and butter was probably six to seven in the morning, and then ten to thirteen in the afternoon. That's kind of how I would approach it. I hope I can get up to that mileage in the next year, and then I'll be running. Um, seven minutes easy or 615 easy or whatever it is i i it seems it sounds pretty good to me i just haven't gotten yes. anywhere close to that level of fitness so uh just gotta build up the volume i guess without getting injured yeah i mean 70 is a lot just for just kind of your average guy you know working at microsoft or whatever like 70 is a lot <laughs> with all the other stress that you have in your life um you know i'm only just back up at 63 i think i hit last week um in five runs so yeah, it's me, not easy yeah. it, 70 would be like mm -hmm. a really big week for me so i would hope that i could get to 70 and think oh i can do this again next week you know but most people yeah are that's a, uh, under that's 70 the trick. i think yeah exactly. i've never done more than yeah. 70 yeah have you done 70 i i have done a 70 before but Ooh. it was also the week of a big event you know so a lot uh, of weekly running kind of kind of easy running and then of course doing a 50 miler uh on the oh weekend, there you go that makes recovery sense. run yeah um but yeah i'd, I'd definitely yeah. like to uh, do more volume you know and i do find that it is easier when you go really easy <laughs> you know uh, low heart rate um just take it you know it just takes longer for me because I'm slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you can just rack up mile after mile after mile, it kind of starts to make a lot of sense. Um, so, so what are the conclusions that we can that we can kind of glean from uh, DeCastella's training? Well, I think that it's it might not be a hundred percent necessary to go through the the linear. Um, periodization strategy as uh, like an Arthur Lydiard or um, even like a Phil Maffetone has outlined, it might have more to do with just the blend of your training. And this goes back to what that exercise physiologist, um, uh, Chris Womack was talking about, um, where you need to kind of have the blend of the right workouts in there. And you can see how DeCastola, you know, he's not overemphasizing his interval training at all. He's out there like pounding pretty hard base miles and pretty consistent base miles throughout the week. Uh, and then he's sprinkling in a little bit of speed. Um, and that keeps things fresh and interesting. And then he's got his hill workout, which, you know, we don't exactly know what that was, but we can kind of assume it was about VO2 max effort. Um, and I guess that's a good strategy for a marathoner. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't think you would see any marathon or train like that these days. You know, they're doing longer tempo runs and longer thresholds. Um, but I think he kind of achieved a good balance through like this kind of strange um, uh, variety of workouts that he had. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I think Matt is frozen at the moment, but oh, you're back. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, basically getting lots of volume in, mixing up, getting a lot of, getting a little bit of really fast 
track workouts could like make up for the fact that you didn't do some longer tempo runs I guess just kind of mixing it up uh, and then you said something about taking four to six weeks to see maybe you're gonna hit a plateau after something like four to six weeks versus ten weeks depending on the individual it seems like he did like de castella he must not have experienced too much of a plateau or he was just kind of always plateaued at a very high level Mm -hmm. um and that must be because like i i kind of think that his hard days were so short that he didn't really have to recover from them a lot like he was basically ready to go and kind of hit the next Mm -hmm. days kind of like hard base pace like pretty hard and that's why it worked out for him so that's kind of like that's kind of my conclusion it's like if you can if you do want to go out and do very, very fast intervals, um, like actually, actually maybe it's better to keep the workout short. So you're not so hammered, um, that you can't get in your miles on the, on like the, the next two, um, days afterwards. That makes sense to me. I, I definitely don't like to run intervals so hard that I feel hammered the next day. (laughs) (laughs) That's usually what I do to myself, honestly. <laughs> I just hammer it. <laughs> I mean, it's that I really like to like go as fast as I can and you know do better than the last time I did the same workout. But at the same time, it's like if my next day of training is supposed to be a long run, I might hold back just a little bit. <laughs> well, that might be the right strategy. All right, so we got quite a bit of learning in today i know i learned a lot i don't know if mike learned a bit but no uh, it was it was good it was uh you know exploring the topic you know periodization is it uh you know it it does seem that there's some other things that work for other people um but uh it has a good track record you know um but rob de casella did i butcher his name de casella (laughs) um his program seems you know quite the opposite um so it's really interesting good stuff well we'll leave it there we'll leave it on a we'll leave a little bit of um uh lack of of concreteness to it um or or lack of certainty i suppose and um uh yeah it's like i say if we do this again i'll probably be trying to mimic his training as closely as possible because i'm training for marathon now as opposed to triathlon so we can check back in and see how my own uh test on myself goes yeah, I'd love to hear how that test goes. And maybe I'll yeah. give it a shot, but my weekly mileage should probably get a little closer to 70 before I decide to do 100 <laughs> a week. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Don't jump up all at once. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us today, Matt. And I look forward to the next uh, episode where we uh, explore something new. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for joining yeah. us. See you later. Thanks for joining. All right, ultra runners.